How would you like to rebuild 600 drones? That's what the tech ops team for DRL does on an almost bi-weekly basis. It's what keeps guys like Jordan Temkin in the air for DRL. And you get to hear Jordan talk about it in just a little bit. Talk to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the man who has probably the best voice in all of FPV, Jordan all Temkin, right. AKA Jet FPV. How you doing, buddy? I am doing wonderful, man. You know, if this FPV thing does not work out for you, you totally could be a radio DJ. I actually, uh, I was on a trip back from China a couple weeks ago, and the guy sitting next to me does all the audio recordings for video games. Oh, and really? Like, yeah, he was like, hey, man, uh, here, just take my card. <laughs> and hit me up if you ever want to do a demo reel or something. I was like, all right. That's awesome, man. Uh, yeah. I, I accidentally washed those pants, and I lost that card. Oh no! But you know, I, I think opportunities like that will they'll come. They'll in time. come. They'll come yeah. in time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's get let's get started. So I, um, in case our our audience doesn't know, which and they've been hiding under a rock because you know this is FPV. Um, you are racing for DRL this year. Yep. And you you have are you, is this your fourth year or is this your third year? This is season four. Season four. So you've raced all yeah. four years. Yes. Yes. And and you took championship first year, right? And second. And second. Damn, that's so, right. So so I won season one in 2016. Uh, okay. Uh, and then I also took season two in 2017. Uh, Nurk. Nurk took last season three. Year. Yeah. Uh, season three, 2018, and then. Now we're in season Still four. Still unfor- un- yeah, unknown for number four. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so getting into DRL first, let's just jump right in. Sure. Um, the one thing that I've seen over the past few days that has like absolutely boggled my mind is you and a couple other folks have posted these pictures on Instagram of racks on racks on <laughs> racks yeah. on racks uh-huh. of racer fours. I mean, like an ungodly amount of racer fours. It how many like are y'all just zoomed in and there's like four of these racks and there's no, a mirror behind no. you or No. There's actually like we don't even capture the amount that they are in our pictures. So they bring I believe this event we just got back from uh, filming an event uh, on Saturday. Yeah. Um, but that event that you were probably seeing pictures of, I believe they had 600 racer fours. Um, which like that's where all the session fives went, isn't it? Yeah, it is. They have <laughs> like a full table, a sheet. They have a sheet of racer fours or of GoPros. It's it's absurd. But like, even when we're taking pictures of those stacks of drones. That's just the ones in the corner that they're not using right now, right? Like, that doesn't include all the ones that they're fixing, all the ones that they're prepping, and all the ones that they're using elsewhere to get ready. Like, there is an absurd, absurd, absurd amount. Um, and out of necessity, because we destroy them. So, oh, well, tell, all right, so tell me about that, because one yeah. of the things I haven't really, so I've interviewed you, I've interviewed Nurk, and I've interviewed Wild, Wild Willie, and mm-hmm. I've, oh, sorry, and also Vanover. Um, none of you have really talked about the type of damage that gets done to these drones when oh, you're racing. every single kind you could ever think. All of the above. So, okay, I think that's actually, that's a good uh, thing to talk about. The One of the most common questions is, are we allowed to swear? You're, it's, you're fine. Right. Uh, why the fuck do you have 600 drones? Is like <laughs> question number one when people find out that we have that many. Right. Uh, and a lot of the people will just assume that it's for show or just cuz or because they're fragile. First of all, they are not fragile. They're actually incredibly durable machines. But you have to remember we're not flying in a park in an open field with grass. Like, it's a stadium, right. right? So when you crash, you crash into immovable objects. It's not grass. It's not a multi-GP nylon banner, webbing banner. It's an I-beam that's 
fucking four feet wide that holds right. up the roof to the stadium. And it doesn't matter how, you know, rando bando edition your frame is, it's going to get wrecked. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's like reason number one is whenever we as pilots crash, they, they generally take a pretty big hit. Um, yeah. And then number two is because of the way the finish line, how we like, it's yeah, all you guys, netted inside. Yeah, you guys zip into that finish line. Right. So, it, I mean, it's all netted. They generally don't break when we go into the finish, but DRL, when, when we're filming, it's 150 people in the background. There's no time to like get the quag stuck out of the net and now let's run over and go put it on the line you know oh let's test and make sure all the props are straight and there's no time for that shit right it's It's like boom into the finish we'll put it in the pile when there's a break sure they'll sort through them and like go like all right that one's fucked that one's all right we'll just put new props on it um but in the moment there's no time for that so if Mm -hmm. we're doing two rounds of semifinals, which is six pilots times seven heats twice over you know that that's a couple hundred drones right there if you if you don't have time to be pulling them and checking them out of the finish so Mm -hmm. i mean that that that's why we have so many um because it's a time is money situation okay what um i had a great question it just escaped me um what is what what's the most brutal damage that you've seen done to one of these drones? Oh, like totally gone. Like all the arms are broken. The electronics <laughs> are just like pancake sheared. There's no more plastic left. The GoPro is like two miles that way, you know, kind oh of thing. Oh my gosh. Um like every once in a while we'll have the cockpit be semi close to one of the obstacles yeah i mean we're all netted it's all safe but every once in a while we'll have like a gopro like ding 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 (laughs) through the cockpit kind of thing um which is always a fun time because we always pick it up and have a good time with it yeah Uh, but yeah yeah i mean they they get wrecked and that's actually half the fun is at the end of the events they'll have like you know the cheap walmart fold out white tables They'll have yeah. like three of those piled as high as possible with just oh broken drones. And they'll all, all have little scribbles on them. Because they write down what broke on them. They'll be like, yeah, you know, bad VTX, bad left motor. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they'll just like write, it's fucked. Uh, <laughs> you know, like it's... I wonder, I don't wonder if I have any pictures. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really, it's some heavy carnage. So if they're if they're recycling through drones as fast as that, how do they? Like, I, I'm assuming that there's not like you know out of that 600 drones, there's not 600 that are geared just for jet. No, like, so they're all identical. They're all the same, and they have a proprietary system that, like, they'll just say, "All right, this one's channel one," and there's a dude on a computer that goes clickety click click. That one's channel one. Enter. Okay. Then it pops over. Or you know, I'm I'm I'm. This is all speculation because as pilots, we don't actually know no how yeah. that works. Um. And but I do know there's you know they have some switches on the drone, maybe some dip switches that they're like boop boop boop. That one's channel one. So they're all the same, and then they get set to whatever channel we're on, and then the colors are set by a, a dude in the background on the computer. Remote. Okay, because because I know right. you know they, they, the colors the colors are actually probably one of the visually the most important mm-hmm. aspects of the race because you know that's how when they come out to the wide shots of you guys rushing down a corridor, right? That's how right. we know. Oh, jets in the lead, or you know, right? So you'll um, see when they're plugging them in, they like plug it in. It will like boot up with whatever the last color was, uh-huh. and then after a few seconds, it will switch to what it's supposed to be because uh-huh. there's a guy. Yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, it was not that way. It was like, okay. these are all Channel 1 drones. These are all Channel 2 drones. But the problem mm. was, if, for example, 
I was crashing more than someone else, I would run out of drones earlier because I don't have 600. Yeah. I only have whatever, you know. Um, so this this year, they've they've done a better job of uh, making them all exactly the same. So it's just one big pool that we're pulling from. Dude, that is. I mean, that's. I can't even. How how big is the team that manages just the the tech team that just manages the drones? Uh, so that's a hard question because there's more than just the dudes who build it. Tech ops, I think I yeah. want to say it's like eight, eight or ten dudes. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the ones who like sit there and build all of them. But there's not just tech ops that helps build the drones, right? There's the engineers yeah. who are doing all the software side and then the hardware side and like. There's definitely more to it than just the guys building it and the guys plugging them in. Um, there is a whole ecosystem around the racers. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's it is it's impressive. It's impressive. It's 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 very impressive. I'm still always in awe, even four years later, or three years later. Um, every time I go to race, I mean that's why we post pictures of the stacks of drones. Yeah, like three I, I mean, years later, I'm still not over the fact that there's a pile of 600 drones sitting there. It's still that's awesome. just yeah, that's yeah. just insane. I mean, it, it, if only I could have like a quarter of those. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't want to, man. No. Like, oh really? Because do you want to manage and fix? Oh God, no! I just drones? they'd be yeah. disposable at that point. Right. Well, they have to fix them. Yeah. Well, yeah. that no, that I, I would not want to fix 600 drones. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's oh man the yeah the heart and soul of DRL is like props to the tech ops guys because those guys pour in blood sweat and tears and probably ungodly hours before events building and fixing every single one of those yeah right? like for example it. we just got back from filming last week we pretty much destroyed all of them uh, and then we have that big chase live event in the uh, end of next week Oh wow! So, so you like, got to get them all back running. Six hundred drones in two weeks. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Like they're they're the real heroes, man. They're the un, unsung souls. Uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. Is it, it is when you guys are setting up for a run, um, for a race? Um, does you know? I I, I know I've, I've occasionally I'll you know look at you guys in the cockpit, and I notice that you've got. Uh, cable, multiple cables going into your goggles, and like, are you guys all transmitting off your radios, or is there a plug into your radios too? No, there's like a JR port with a cable that comes out. Okay, so yeah. everything is everything is wired into their proprietary system then. Yep, yep. Okay. So we use Fat Sharks and we use the Tyrannus, but there's a they built a JR module that has a cable that feeds into this box uh, that also has wires that come from our goggles that feed into the box and then that box feeds into the RF team like there's a team of okay. guys who it's a bunch of dudes with a bunch of PhDs in RF <laughs> that do all of that that's like way over my head yeah, yeah. I can I, I uh, who was it it was um, uh, Nick Willard mentioned one day he, he wandered around uh, mm-hmm. And got too close to where they were managing some of the RF stuff, and and he he was like, he said it was basically just like, what are you doing? Get away! Go go go! Get them out of here! <laughs> <laughs> it's because we're always trying to sneak all the little information that we can get because we're like curious, right? It's out of curiosity yeah. for us because we just like to nerd out about that. So yeah, yeah, uh, we we've sometimes find out things that we're not supposed to know which is yeah. half the fun yeah exactly um so you know one of the things that i've talked to nurk and vanover about both specifically um is the grind right like getting ready for a mm-hmm. race the prep is you get into racing you know ready getting ready for an event what does that look like for you um well like vanover is a different beast when it comes to that I mean, we know he's a teenager. He just like wakes up, flies all day in his backyard, repeat. Mm-hmm. You know, keep keep talking. Um, I gotta move around. Yeah, no worries. Uh, and then for me, 
Uh, I used to not do that back in the day, um, but the talent pool has gotten to a point where it's a necessity, right? Like, right. Sure, three years ago you could be just like good at flying and be good at racing and mm-hmm. do well. Uh, nowadays, just because of the amount of dedication that people have to mm-hmm. being like uber pro, uh, the best of the best, um, yeah, you got to put in the grind. Um, and I do do that. Uh, I was just out for five hours today at the field, just pack after pack after pack after pack after pack. Got a Jenny with two chargers or four chargers and just mm-hmm. unlimited flying. And it's exhausting and I it's you know it's pretty mind numbing at points yeah uh but uh, the way i see it it's like any other athletics right um if you're like so i come from a skiing background uh and mm-hmm. you gotta in that case you gotta put in the time right you go do leg lifts and you go do stairs and you go work on just boring ass training shit that makes your body stronger so that when it's time to perform you're able to perform um, and that's the way I see drone practice too is it's like no I don't like doing it it sucks but you do it because it, it allows you to perform at your peak okay um, you were the, you know talking about having to put in the grind now versus what it was like to begin with you know mm-hmm. winning season one and two yeah how has it changed up to this point um well i mean the talent pool has gotten bigger as in mm-hmm. the top talent pool let's say uh three or four years ago back in 2015 2016 era i would if someone was like how many top pilots are there in the world mm-hmm. i would be like there's probably 20 dudes who could like duke it out at the top and it would be good racing now mm-hmm you ask that question and there's what like how many people are in the multi gp uh champs list right 200 two or 300 right like the pool has gone up a order of magnitude in the span of three years um and i i think that that's what i mean by it is there's just more people who are trying hard to be dedicated racers uh, just the amount of people flying FPV, I think, was a lot smaller back then too, and a lot mm-hmm. less people were taking it seriously as like a career path. Mm-hmm. Um, and now there's significantly more people who want to be pro pilots, who are dedicated to being mm-hmm. pro pilots, and are capable and have the skill and talent to be able to be pro pilots. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's necessarily that. Well, like yes, we're all better now. Like, if I were to race three-year-old me, I'd whoop his ass. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, yeah, I think it's just there's a a bigger talent pool at the top. Okay. And would you say that? Go ahead. uh, I think anyone that has been around since, like, 2015 racing would say the same. Okay. Um, Yeah. So would you say, you know, my follow-up question, it sounds like you've already answered it, is... You know, what has been like if you had to pick one big change, it sounds like that's it. Just the talent pool at the top. Yeah, which I think is fucking awesome. Like, for example, uh, multi GPIO. Mm hmm. Um, in the past, I was able to show up and like qualify with my freestyle rig, and it didn't fucking matter. Right. Um, now, I actually didn't qualify this year, partially because we had come straight from a DRL race. Like, all of us right. DRL flew there. So I had been flying only the racer for, like, three weeks, and then we had to go fly 5-inch, and I'd, like... It's such a different rig that it's yeah. super... It was hard to get used to. Um, and, like, that to me proves how big that talent pool was, was it was, like, cutthroat to get in the top 64. Like mm-hmm. the how close all those pilots were, and how many people there were that were like gunning to be TQ. Like that's mm-hmm. all they wanted. They sat there on the on that uh, IO track, World Cup track, for like four days straight, just grinding it out. And like back that, like I feel like a few years ago, no one was really doing it to that level. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think there's just a different mentality now to racing, where it used to be more fun and games, and now there's more seriousness to it, uh, which is yeah. good. You know, I'm I'm all for it because that was like some that was really fun to watch, um, and I'm I'm always down to watch some awesome competitive stuff. Yeah. Jordan does an amazing job at Duro. He is definitely a top pilot, and it is super exciting to watch him race. In our next episode, we talk about what Jordan's favorite memory is from all the years of DRL that he's done, because he's been in all four of them. Y'all, let's have a real talk for a minute. I tried some sponsors, and I think I'm going to take a break from that. It's not that I didn't appreciate the sponsorships. I actually did, and it was nice having some real money come in, but it felt a little disingenuous to have a sponsorship on one hand and then this thing that I'm doing, which is almost journalistic FPV on the other. So I'm gonna take a break and rethink that for a little while. What I will thank is my patrons. Um, they help me think through and give me the motivation to do all of this that I do for you. So it's not just my subscribers, but my patrons are the ones that every time somebody joins as a patron, it's like, man, somebody loves what I do. They don't love it enough to just be a subscriber. They love it enough to financially support it. And if you, if, that, if that's not you, don't join my Patreon. If money's tight, don't, don't join my Patreon. If you do love what I do and you think it's worthwhile, then join my Patreon. It's as simple as that. I also want to talk about Give Back October. You know, someone asked me the other day, uh, Mike, what are you going to do when you've interviewed everybody? Well, that was everybody big. And quite frankly, there, uh, I mean, how many more big names can I get? Everybody wants me to get Charpu. <laughs> I can talk to Tommy. Um, I've got some big names coming up in the towards the end of September. But I'm going to spend October giving back, giving back to the little guys, giving back to folks that are the unsung heroes of the drone community because they put in the time and the effort and they don't get the monetary or famous reward that some of the big names that I've interviewed get. So look for that in October. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And I know that I am super excited for Give Back October.